turn now to our next reading of Scripture, coming from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Be careful, then, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades. The word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. Right from the start, from this portion of Ephesians, Paul says to be careful. Meanwhile, just a little bit ago, we got Jesus' strange-sounding words from the Gospel of John that the Jewish leaders jumped all over. Asking, how can this man give us flesh to eat? Fair question. Well, he's not actually saying for us to be cannibals, obviously. Uh, just to eat bread and drink wine that represents his body and blood. It's obvious enough, that's why we're not all hung up on the issue today. And thankfully we have the other Gospels that, um, that don't describe it in quite those words that makes it, you know, a little more palatable. Um, it's kind of funny to me, though, that Jesus didn't spell it out for these leaders who were accusing him. Jesus answers their question by repeating himself. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And again, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. And he says it a few more times. And he doesn't spell it out in a way that, you know, would, would probably be more helpful, um, but just says it over and over again. So you just have to know that he's talking about the bread and the wine. Uh, of course, the previous paragraph, he was calling himself the bread of life and made some more um, distinct connections to the bread. Um, but still, this, uh, the, the statements were kind of hard to take in. It seems as though those religious leaders were maybe trying to be careful not to fall under the guidance of someone leading them to become cannibals. Um, yes, we should definitely be careful not to fall into disturbing directions like that and following people who would lead us uh, in those kinds of ways. However, those religious leaders, I don't think they were really being careful in that sense. Um, the gospel kind of spells it out for us that those folks were out to get Jesus. They were trying to trap him in any way possible. The way that Jesus presents the bread and the wine here in John left it wide open for them to jump all over him. The way he said it was absolutely off-putting. It was uncomfortable, to say the least. The way they responded showed that they were not being careful, actually, but quite foolish. Acting as unwise people, they fell under the guidance of something sinister. Instead of understanding the will of the Lord, what's good and right for all of humanity and creation, they were working to obstruct the will of the Lord. Under this guise that they were, you know, being careful not to follow some crazy guy talking about eating flesh and blood. Uh, but what they were doing was trying to obstruct God's will. For the most part, Paul's message is straightforward from Ephesians. Not hard to understand. So the words from John can get a little tricky. Um, but Paul's message is very straightforward. 
As people of faith, we must be careful how we live, at least if, Christ, if being Christian means anything to us. We must be wise, make wise decisions, use our time wisely. There is great purpose in who we are, and we need to respect that. Although the reasoning for how we conduct ourselves throws me off a little bit. It's one of those small quotes in passing that's very easy to overlook and forget about, uh, to focus on things that make more sense to us. But we do ourselves a disservice by ignoring it. What does Paul mean by saying that the days are evil? He says, make the most of the time because the days are evil. Is it that easy to write the days off as evil? Is there not good in the world that counteracts the evil in the world? Sure, we have days when absolutely everything goes wrong. Days that seem to test us in every way. Sometimes it seems like there's nothing but evil all around us. Are there not also days when things go right? When it seems like there's good all around us? The world is God's creation. Each day is a gift from God. How is it that Paul can call the days evil without qualifying it in some way? Personally, I don't really like how it sounds like everything in a day is bad. Um, but the way he describes it does go along with um, the way Paul describes things and the way he thinks about things. God is good, the world is bad. Spirit is good, flesh is bad. It's kind of black and white kind of descriptions of things. Um, even though, you know, looking more closely, there's a lot more gray than, uh, than might meet the eye at first. According to Paul, we must choose God's ways over the world's ways. So describing the days as bad is really connecting to the world's ways. And we've picked up on that way of describing it, even though we understand that not everything in the world is bad. And I think Paul absolutely understood that too. He expects us to take what he's saying, for us to take what he's saying as it is. Life can be very, very harsh. Life is very harsh and unforgiving. We've got to be careful not to let that make us harsh and unforgiving. Meanwhile, life is also much more than that. And so are we. To help us be careful and wise, Paul addresses uh, alcohol and advises us not to get drunk with wine. Now, obviously, if, now I'm, I'm going to continue trying to be serious here as that picture is there. I just couldn't pass up putting it. Uh, obviously, if the Lord's Supper involves wine, we are not being told that we have to avoid alcohol altogether, but that we absolutely should not get carried away with it. Had this movie on yesterday, which the opening scene was that of a man waking up on the floor next to empty, empty beer bottles, starting his day with the hangover and totally confused. He didn't remember what all happened the night before, and he was surprised to find out that his wife wasn't there. He found his, his wife at her mom's house, and when he did, he saw that her face was all bruised up because he beat her up in his drunken stupor. Once again, he swore that he would change, that he'd quit drinking, and he threw out every remaining bottle that he had, which left his wife wondering, is he for real? Can he be trusted? You know, should she leave and never come back? And so on. Lots of questions. No matter what he swore, the damage was done, and he was likely to do it again. Paul understood the problems that come with abusing alcohol, and that it's easy to be swayed by it and lose touch with reality. And that being careful and wise about life isn't very compatible with such things. And I had a brief, strange moment uh, once in an internet chat group. 
Now, what you see there is actually not the chat. It, it, that Mario Kart or whatever they're talking about has, you know, isn't the chat. Just, just a picture of a chat group. Um, this was just a general conversation. It's nothing religious or anything. And I made a comment at one point about how love conquers all. And then a member of the group responded to that by saying, not Lord Satan. Hmm? Yeah, that's what, that's what I said. You can imagine the question marks running through my mind. Like, are, are you serious? Is that some kind of joke? You know, you've got to be kidding me. At first, I treated it like it was an attempt to be funny, uh, kind of. Uh, my, resp my response to that was, well, especially that one. You know, love conquers all, and especially Satan. And, of course, I put LOL at the end. You know, it's kind of a way to, to say something serious, but kind of lighten it up as though you're kind of joking with them. But you're really being serious, but, you know, kind of passive-aggressive kind of thing. Um, but kind of playing along, trying to, as if it was a joke. And I hope that would be the end of it, but then I got their response saying, Lord Satan is kind. Okay, maybe this wasn't a joke after all. Is this person really trying to convince me that Satan is kind? I guess they didn't know that they were barking up the wrong tree with this one. But my dilemma is what's the correct response to this? Do I ignore it? Like, maybe it'll go away. Maybe nobody else in the chat saw it. Uh, do I pull out my pastor card and get all religious on him? And, you know, this was a group conversation with people of all backgrounds. And uh, it, it wasn't very religious at all. And I didn't really want to go there with it. You know, I didn't want it to be off-putting to other people in the chat who had nothing to do with these, these strange comments. Um, also, I'm committed to respecting other people's religious beliefs, but this, you know, this, this was just a little much. I couldn't let this go. I couldn't run the risk of others in the chat falling into that trap of thinking that the devil is anything good. I just felt a responsibility to respond to that. I had to respond. I had to rebuke that claim that Satan is kind. But I had to be sober-minded and careful and wise about how I did it. I had to shine some light on it. I had to expose that claim and expose the devil in a, but, but to do so in a calm and collected way. After some thought, I responded and I wrote, more like deceptive. Thankfully, that was the end of that. Same the point got across and uh, I was able to say my piece in very few words and then the conversation was able to carry on to a more positive uh, and constructive direction. Paul speaks important words when he tells us to be careful in this world. Those religious leaders with Jesus were not being careful. While they tried to come off as being careful about what Jesus was saying, they were foolishly falling into treacherous ways and were trying to trap Jesus with his own words to make him look like the bad guy. Alcohol and whatever else are additional things that cloud our judgment and make us even more likely to fall into wrongful ways and to be tricked um, into wrongful ways. Or it may not even take anything like that. We can be led into foolishness very easily. Although the world is certainly not all bad, evil is definitely hanging around constantly wanting to deceive us into thinking that right is wrong and that wrong is right. And to lead us into harsh and unforgiving ways. To lead us into treachery. We've got to be very careful. Not to fall into the negativity um, that is so common and present. Not to fall into all around self-serving behavior. Because we have a great purpose. We have been given a direction. We have been given great responsibility as Christians. To help us navigate through the days we've got the Holy Spirit. To rely on, to fill us, to lead us, to guide our every step. Be filled, with, be filled not with wine, but with the Spirit. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among each other and in our hearts. 
Careful and wise living is always looking to the Lord for guidance and finding ways to give thanks to God at all times for everything in the name of Christ. To live into the truth. We've got to be very careful and wise so that we might live into the truth. May we live as careful and wise people of God, making the most of every day. May the Spirit guide us to understand and live into the will of the Lord. Amen.